let us look at uh, the second one, first and third we sorted out last time. And uh, the second one is uh, product of less than equal to product of And uh, now notice that absolute value of z i lies between half and twice of the absolute value of z. So, z over z i therefore, lies the absolute value of z over z i is going to be between half and 2. So, this quantity in the exponent is at most e square. an absolute value of z i is at most 2 times absolute value of z. And we are left with absolute value of z minus z i in the denominator. Now, this is where we run into problem, because what if z is equal to z i then this of course, is uh, unbounded and this which may happen right. Z i lies between an absolute value between z by 2 and 2 z. So, it may happen that there is equal z i. So, that is if I choose my z in such a such that it equals z i in a precisely then this is unbounded and therefore, I cannot bound it. But if you recall the proof of um, the pound or the nature of the entire function of order 1 without any zeros, in that proof that uh, the function must be of the kind e to the a z plus b, what we used was that for infinitely many r's mod f z at mod z equals r is bounded by e to the order r to the 1 plus epsilon. Right. We did not know this property to hold, we did not require this property to hold for all r's, we only required it to hold for infinitely many r's. And that is what we are attempting to do here, when we if you go back. So, we want to show that this is an entire function of order 1 with no zeros, which we know of course. And uh, in order to show that, all we need is to show that this absolute value of this whole function is bounded by e to the order mod z to the 1 plus epsilon for infinitely many mod z's, not for all mod z's. So, that gives us some flexibility in choosing the z here. And what we will do is, we will choose a z such that z the absolute value of z is not in this set.
consider the interval of numbers which is between mod z i minus 1 over mod z i square to mod z i plus 1 over mod z i square. And for each z i take the union of these intervals and we want to pick a z such that mod z is not in this any of these intervals. Is that possible? Can we choose infinitely many such z's? Yes, we can. Why? What is the range of this one single interval? Yeah, but what is the exact value between that? We can compute the exact value. One interval corresponding to i, what is the range of values? So, this to this. So, what is the difference between the ranges? So, that is that is the number of values which are omitted right for your z i z to b. So, the number of values omitted or the range of values omitted has 2 by z i square right. So, total uh, values omitted is 2 by actually it is less than equal to, because for two different i's this intervals may overlap. And this is bounded, right. Therefore, only finitely many values are ruled out. So, you still have the whole range the infinite many values for your z to choose from. So, you can always choose a larger and infinitely many z satisfying this property. Now, for such a z let us go back this is the quantity we want to estimate not this. What is the difference between z and z i? At least one over z i squared. Right? Because z is not in this interval for any z i. So z i is at z is therefore with respect to any z i, it is at least one over z i square away from that. So, we can replace the denominator here by 1 over z i squared and get an upper bound. and z i is upper bounded by 2 times z. So, you get 8 e square mod z cubed. And how many times are you multiplying this? Well, the number of times you are multiplying this is the number of z i's in this range. How many z i's are there in this range? We know the count uh, e to the mod z to the 1 plus delta at most, right. So, therefore, this is less than equal to 8 e square mod z cubed whole to the power order. No, not e to the power sorry. The number of z i's number of roots are bounded by order 
mod z to the 1 plus delta that we have shown. And this is of course, the thing inside here does not move the scale here at all. Right? You take everything in the exponent, you just maybe add multiply this with 3 log n or so and which does not move this delta to anything just sort of stays the same. delta prime with a little slightly bigger delta. And that is it. So, this bounds this entire this product for infinitely many z's and therefore, and for all z's we know that f z is bounded by the same. So, together this whole absolute value for infinitely many z's is bounded by e to the mod z to the 1 plus epsilon prime for some epsilon prime small enough and therefore, f z over product over i greater than equal to 1 is an entire function. order 1 with no zeros and z equals convinced. So, this is the. So, the at this point I am going to end my diversion into the theory of entire functions and we will step back a level up and what was that level? Gamma function you are trying to get a bound on gamma prime over gamma that was the starting point and then I said that we will completely analyze the gamma function and then we will derive from that analysis the bound on gamma prime over gamma. So, let us step back into gamma function and see where we are. Now, we know that I think we have already shown right. That 1 by gamma z is an entire function of order 1 right. Does it have any zeros? No, no of course, it has plenty of zeros, because it has it has poles at all the negative integers. So, the it has plenty of zeros. So, we stick that in, but does it have is 0 at z equals 0? It does gamma 0 is what is gamma 0? It is unbounded right, because it is gamma 0 is gamma 1 over 0 which is unbounded. So, it does have a 0 at 0 1 over gamma 0. So, that therefore, by this whole previous analysis how can we write the gamma function of inverse gamma function. E to the a z plus b times z 
this z is for the 0 at z equals 0 and it is a 0 of order 1. So, we just multiply it with z and leave it at that times product n greater than equal to 1 1 plus z over n e to the minus z over n. Now, here we still have not fi uh, fixed the value of this constant say n b, but that is not too difficult to do. Uh, what is z comma z at z equals 0? is gamma 1 is gamma 1 because gamma z is gamma z plus 1 we divide by z. So, z gamma z is gamma z plus 1 as z goes to 0 z gamma z is gamma 1 right which is 1. So, 1 over z gamma z is 1 at z equals 0. and we plug this in into this expression what do you get when z is 0 this whole product is 1 everything here is 1 z equals 0 this is e to the a z vanishes. So, you get e to the b equals 1 this implies that b is 0. So, that takes care of one constant what about the other constant? One over z gamma z is one. So you take this. So you take this z here down here, and then take the limit. Okay. Now what about gamma z at z equals one? Of course, that's one. So, let us plug that in also for z equals 1. What do we get? E to the a times product n greater than equal to 1, 1 plus 1 by n e to the minus 1 by n this is equal to 1. Okay. But this is not so straightforward to work out, but we can do a little bit of trickery here to work this product what the value to calculate the value of this product or does anyone know an expression for this product. Yeah, that is a good idea take the log and see what works out. Okay. But before taking the log I what I am going to do is bound this up to some capital N. And then eventually we will take n capital N to infinity to get the value. Now take the log. So, what is the log value here? Log of this product this equals let us simplify this, okay, let us not take the log let us just try to simplify this. 
this is equal to product 1 less than equal to n less than equal to capital N, n plus 1 divided by n a to the minus 1 by n. Okay. So, this is e to the summation 1 less than equal to n less than capital N minus 1 by n times product of 1 going to uh, n going from 1 to capital N n plus 1 over n. So, what is that product? So, it is like 2 by 1 times 3 by 2 times 4 by 3 times dot 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 up to capital N plus 1 divided by n. This, this just leaves out capital N plus 1. I do not even need to take log here. Now, is the expression in the exponent familiar to you? What is this one? The sum. This is harmonic series truncated at capital N, and this is log of n plus 1. In fact, let me write this as So, look at this expression log n minus the harmonic series truncated at capital N. As n tends to infinity, what happens to this? That is a very familiar quantity, math student. Euler's gamma can you remember? Log n is very well approximated by this summation up to n 1 plus 1 half plus 1 third plus 1 quarter up to 1 by n. And the difference between log n and this sum as n tends to infinity tends towards a fixed constant gamma, which is like 0 0.40 something something. That is that constant was first described by Euler. So, it was called it is called Euler's constant. Okay. And as n tends to infinity what happens to log n plus 1 over n? It goes away 0. Right. So, so therefore, we get that this product e to the gamma. Now, okay, I think I should put a minus sign here, because this sum is always bigger than the log. But say, when capital N is 3, then log 3 is very close to 1, because to the base e, so that is very close to 1, whereas this is 1 plus half plus 1 third, so that is bigger and it stays bigger. So, the difference between these two or rather this minus this is gamma, this minus this. So, the difference is minus gamma. So, that is that is what you get and therefore, what is e to the a? 
we just worked described that this is e to the gamma. So, A is gamma. Now, this completely describes the gamma function, there is nothing left out here. You know, each and every single constant appearing, how does it factor, how does it add up, everything is there. And this is the expression for gamma function that now we will use to give a bound on gamma prime over gamma okay and the way to do it is pretty simple take the log of both sides and differentiate so if we take the log of both sides what do we get minus log of gamma z equals small gamma z plus log z plus summation n greater than equal to 1 log of 1 plus z over n minus z over n. Okay. Now, because we have taken the log again, we have to say something about the validity of this expression. So, the simplest way of you know describing the validity of this expression is to say that just take cut out one line that for whatever log of whatever thing we are taking that quantity we for that quantity we cut that line from 0 to negative infinity that real line and say that on the rest of the domain it is well defined. But we are taking log of on the right hand side log of 1 plus z over n of course, we are taking log z here also. So, if you uh, think about what we need to avoid it turns out that we need to avoid essentially the real line. Uh, well, actually not the whole real line I think uh, let us see n greater than 1 I think negative real line is what we need to avoid so, from 0 to all the way up to minus infinity that negative real line if you can avoid this is well defined. because if it is uh, that is right, if z is minus n then this becomes 0 and then log becomes undefined. Right. So, that is the problem we do not want to run into. So, we just avoid the negative real line for z values that is it. Uh, So, let me note it here this is valid and that is what we need to keep in mind and that also takes care of all this duplicacy also once you cut out make this cut then the log function is analytic on the rest of the domain. So, everything works out fine. Now, differentiate now we can differentiate because analytic now log of this we can differentiate and what do we get on the left hand side we get minus gamma prime over gamma 
equals small gamma plus 1 by z plus n greater than equal to 1 1 by n divided by 1 plus z by n minus 1 by n So, what comes out on the right is a very simple expression. Okay. And uh, this is uh, well defined whenever z does not take values in the negative uh, real line. In fact, one can go one step further and say that is. Uh, this part at least is well defined whenever n does not take negative integer values, okay. but let us just stay with the negative uh, real not z not taking negative real values. So, now in order to estimate this quantity we need to estimate the right hand side, which seems like a not too difficult task and indeed it is not too difficult. But now we have to really dig back and go one level up and recall where did we require to bound gamma prime over gamma or for what sets. Do you remember? We were looking at you are looking at this rectangle. right? And uh, we wanted to show that this is this integral is what we are interested in. So, we want to get rid of all these three integrals and I said that we will first start with this integral which is the simplest to handle. And so, we were at this point when we diverged into gamma function. So, let us get back to this. So, to start with we consider z in minus u plus i r to minus u minus i r. Hmm. And since we want to avoid hitting a pole here, remember there can be poles of gamma functions here. Since we want to avoid hitting a pole we take u to be odd integer, because remember we were actually looking at gamma of z by 2 and analyze or rather gamma prime of z by 2 divided by gamma of z by 2. So, when u is an odd integer we are essentially looking at when you look at gamma prime z over gamma z it is a the midpoint between two integers is what we are getting. At. So, we do not, so this line never hits a pole is as far away from a pole as possible. So, that is the z we are looking at. Now, for such a z or in general for z which are reasonably far away from poles of gamma, 
what is the bound on gamma prime work. And what is this bound equal to? Just look at this, this is constant, this is 1 by z and 1 by z, 1 by mod z actually, 1 by mod z, mod z is way out there, it will at least u which is at most 1. So, this gets absorbed into order constant here. So, what is left out is plus summation n greater than equal to 1 mod of So, if you can estimate this modulus of this whenever z is far away from negative integers then we get a good estimate. So, how do we estimate this? When you close the this looks again familiar, should look familiar. Okay, so, to estimate this we again we will use the same trick that consider the sum from 1 to capital N of this quantity, Green, derive an expression to it and then send N to infinity. So, if we consider we want to bound this. What is the second guy bounded with? We know that, that is like log of capital N plus the Euler's constant right. So, that we know we understand it very well. What about the first guy? z sticking out in all of the denominators. Well, it would be convenient if we can replace this sum by an integral, because we can integrate things far more easily than sum them up, we agree right. And now, there is a standard way of replacing sums with integrals. That is called uh, in, in long time ago Euler Maclaurin, Euler and Maclaurin. So, it is called the Euler Maclaurin formula. So, again I will take a bit of a diversion from here and take you into Euler Maclaurin formula. So, this in general talks about sums like this. And what this corresponds to in terms of integrals. In fact, it does not even say that 
you should be 1 to n it can you can replace it with a and b. And the formula says of course, I will I am sure I remember it incorrectly. So, let me write something and when we derive it we will come back and correct it. So, that is the main part it is like this sum is same as this integral, but then there are some problems here which are the error terms. plus or minus no I do not remember let us take a guess it is probably minus. Prime t and then there is this funny expression Okay, so, this is as I said this is only my guess of what the formula is, but it is close enough. Okay, so, let us derive this it is it does not require any anything fancy. Oh, we are out of time. Kitna time which I Kitna time Okay. tape may have time which all okay. So let's find out an expression for this. Okay, how do we do that? A simple trick here, and that has got to do with this quantity. Let us look at this. That's not right. Let's just take this integral, and let's do integration by parts. Now, what do you mean by integration? By there is only one quantity here. Well, so what I'll do is times one times t t. So, the other part is 1. This is equal to f t and then integrate 1. What do you get when you integrate 1? You get uh, t right. Okay. So, now let me let me do something funny here. I integrate from k to k plus 1 just over 1 integer and integrating this I get t, but instead of 
actually there will be a t plus I can bring in any constant here okay. So, I will integrate this to t minus k minus half so, I am perfectly within my rights to do this. Then there is an other part is negative f prime t, and then I integrate the one in the same fashion. They these are important, right? So this becomes t minus k minus half dt. Now what's the first one of these? That's f k plus one. Right, and uh, what you get there is one half, uh, one minus one minus half, so half, half of f k plus one, and minus minus of minus is becomes plus plus half of f k minus this integral. Okay. Now, sum it over from for k going from a to b minus 1. So, I am assuming that a and b are integral points. Is what? Sum over this for k going from a to b minus 1. So, what do you get? Half of f of a plus half of f of a plus 1, then next time around you get half of f of a plus 1 plus half of f of a plus 2 and then again and again and again. So, you basically get half of f a plus full f a plus 1 plus f a plus 2 plus f a plus 3 all the way up to f of b minus 1 and then you get half of f b. So, this is therefore, f n minus half of f a plus f b right minus a to b f prime t t minus now k is same as floor of t because now I am replacing the limits from k to k plus 1 to a to b. So, in within this range floor of t is exactly k, when you go to the next integral range floor of t becomes k plus 1 and so on. So, that perfectly mimics this good. So, I was actually right my first instincts were right this should have been a plus. So, we just take it from the right hand side you get this that is it. Okay. So, now let us just apply this onto this summation. This is equal to what integral from 1 to capital N 1 over z plus t d t plus half of f of a is 
1 over 1 plus n and oops 1 plus not 1 plus n sorry what am I saying z plus 1 plus 1 over z plus n plus derivative of f prime that is equal to actually I can take this in z plus t whole square then minus sign t minus floor of t minus half And this is okay. First integral is what? Log z plus t. Plus half till n minus. Now, in absolute value, or let's I will not get into the absolute value yet. Um, this term, just let's look at this. This is sort of the error term for me. If you look at the numerator here, it is always at most half, right, no matter what the value of t is. So, numerator is at most half. The denominator is of course, 1 z plus t whole square. So, if I try to get a bound on the error term, the absolute value of this. So, let us just look at the error term, the absolute value of this. this is equal to half this integral is uh, 1 by z plus t minus 1 by z plus t actually right and going from 1 to n So, we have an estimate on the value of the error term. Now, we have everything what we want in place. So, now it is just we will put it together next time and derive the estimate.